Okay, so uh, today let us discuss a new topic basically that uh, involves um, studying matters which are of uh, importance and interest to condensed matter physics. But before I do that, uh, let me uh, recollect uh, where I had left off. That means I had uh, stopped right here, which where I discussed something called current algebra. So, in current algebra means I showed that uh, the density and current of a collection of a particles can be written in this so called second quantized notation. So, where uh, you write it in terms of creation and annihilation of particles. So, you have operators that correspond to creating and annihilating particles at some point in space. So, that will enable you to rewrite the density of particle and current, current density in this way. So, 8.102 and 8.103. Now, I had also convinced you that uh, these operators obey something called the current algebra which is a closed commutation rule between the components of current and the density. So, that means, uh, the density commutes amongst themselves and the density and appropriate component of the current density commutes, uh, commutator is also proportional again to the density itself. So, similarly, uh, two different components of the density, uh, the commutator of them is also proportional to the appropriate components of the current. So, these are closed commutation rules in the sense that the, so if you look at uh, density and current, the components of current as uh, members of some family, the commutator, the mutual commutators between them at equal times of course, they are themselves expressible in terms of the same family. That means, you do not have to again invoke something new. So, that is why it is uh, it's called current algebra. So, it is interesting for that reason. But then, uh, in fact, this current algebra enables us to rewrite the current density in a very powerful, simple way. So, you rewrite current density as, uh, so normally density, current density is defined as particle density times the volt, uh, velocity of the fluid. So, it is rho times V, J is rho times V. But then, in order for current algebra to be valid, uh, you can convince yourself, so it is not that easy because you have to show that um, this is the only way of doing it. So, in other words, you can convince yourself that rho j is rho times v is by definition. You can always write a v which is j by rho so long as uh, you only focus on points where rho is not 0, then I can always think of uh, v as uh, j by rho. But now the question is uh, what is the property of v, I mean uh, is v simply related in some way to rho? And the answer is yes. So, you can in fact, uh, you can show that uh, current algebra implies that V should be expressible whenever uh, at all points where rho does not become 0, V is irrotational. That means, the velocity which is defined as J by rho is basically the velocity is uh, expressible as the negative gradient or basically the gradient of some scalar which typically use it as negative gradient. So, we think of it as negative gradient. So, I um, showed first of all that this is consistent with current algebra, but that is not good enough, but you have to show that this is the only way of doing it. So, uh, in order to show that I uh, assume the more general possibility and I showed that uh, the more general possibility is not consistent uh, with uh, our uh, requirements. That is basically it is not consistent with current algebra. So, in other words, the simpler uh, option is the only one. Okay, so, that is important because later on we will be using this in uh, something called Bosonization. So, after all you see uh, once you write uh, in terms of density and this velocity potential called pi. So, the uh, pi commutes with uh, other other pi's that means, pi of r commutes with pi of r dash and rho of r commutes with rho of r dash. But then pi at commutator rho is actually uh, uh, proportional to Dirac delta function. So, in that sense they are actually bosons because they, are, they canonically conjugate uh, objects. So, that can be used to re-express uh, fermions in terms of these uh, what are now bosons. They are bosons because they are very closed, I mean the commutators are uh, proportional to identity rather than anti-commutators. 
So the commutators are proportional. So commutators of rho and rho and pi and pi are identically zero, but the commutator of rho and uh, rho and pi is proportional to the Dirac delta function, which is basically the identity times some number. So bottom line is that uh, once you identify canonical bosons in the theory, see this uh, this uh, way of writing v in terms of the gradient of pi with a minus sign is always valid regardless of whether the underlying particles are bosons or fermions okay so the distinction comes somewhere else which i'll get to some, somewhat later okay so um, at that level it's uh, the currents and density have the same form regardless of whether the underlying particles are fermions or bosons okay so that is pretty much where i had left off i showed you that current algebra implies the existence of an irrotational velocity okay so now uh, i am going to switch gears and uh, discuss something else and that something else is basically uh, quantum fields on a lattice so till now i had described creating and annihilating particles in uh, basically empty space that means you can create a particle at some position r and that r is continuously anything so you could create uh, fermions or bosons wherever you want but then for applications in solid state physics typically what happens is that uh, we think of the interesting dynamical uh, objects in a solid as being the electrons the ion i mean basically the uh, the positive charges in the solid are actually very um, they are very um, inert in the sense that it's much easier for the electrons to participate in dynamical phenomena due to their lightness and due to the fact that they are very mobile and light and they are also charged right so they are electrically charged and they are light uh, whereas the positive charges are uh, several thousand times heavier and they are stuck at their lattice positions so that's typically what a solid is so uh, so in the most idealized situation we uh, only uh, focus on the uh, the electrons and uh, more or less think of the positive charges as providing a predefined uh, background potential so in other words the the implication is that solid state physics is the study of uh, the theoretical solid state physics is the study of uh, the properties of the electrons in a solid typically by assuming the crystal structure uh, which is gleaned from experimental data so that means we assume that a solid has a certain stoichiometry that means we know what it's made of and we not only know what it's made of we also know where all the atoms are sitting so that is an important uh, uh, assumption so that that uh, you might think that that's bit of an anti climax in the sense that that's uh, like assuming pretty much a whole lot which is in fact true it's somewhat like uh, i always like to give this example it's like running the marathon 10 meters before the finish line so if you're asked to run a marathon you know you should honestly start exactly where everybody else is starting but this way of doing solid state physics is like running marathon 10 meters below the finish line but a surprising amount of uh, physics has been done using this sort of an approach and uh, for reasons uh, that are somewhat mysterious in many times these types of approaches seem to suffice in the sense that a lot of important insights about the nature of the solid can be gleaned uh, just by starting that way and perhaps augmenting that type of an approach with some more ad hoc assumptions about the dynamics of the lattice so that's typically for example you introduce lattice vibrations so rather than first predicting where all the atoms are sitting you assume where the atoms are sitting from experimental data like x-ray crystallography and then you work out the vibrational modes of the atoms and then and then you try and uh, study the i mean the dynamics of the lattice that way and that sort of thing is already quite complicated 
and uh, so that is not, it's not really fair to think of that as uh, starting from the finish line. It is still not starting, honestly starting from the starting point, but still uh, it is somewhere midway. So, uh, but uh, that is still quite challenging and uh, that is how solid state physics has been progressing till now. So, it is important therefore, for us to learn uh, how to study the dynamics of electrons specifically in a solid given the fact that the, the, those electrons move around in a pre-existing lattice of positive charges whose locations are known beforehand. Okay. So, that is precisely this chapter 9 which is quantum fields on a lattice. Okay, the fields I am referring to is the, the electron field, right, the fermion field. So, you will see that it actually makes more sense uh, in uh, to now stop thinking of uh, the space as being a continuum. Rather, it makes more sense now, see now that you have resigned yourself to the fact that you will not uh, inquire about the origin of the lattice itself that somebody has already told you that there is a lattice and the electrons just go from, from one point on the lattice to the other. So, in that uh, if you accept that starting point then it stands to reason that uh, you would it makes more sense to think of this underlying space as not being continuous at all, but rather made of these discrete points which whose locations are determined beforehand. We already know where all the points are on the lattice. So, now the thing is that uh, our space itself has now been discretized. So, now the electrons uh, with the fermion fields that live on the lattice. So, that means, if I want to create or annihilate, now I have to ins rather than creating and annihilating at some particular point like I was doing earlier. So, and that point can be anywhere. So, instead of doing that, now I am forced to create and annihilate at exactly one of the uh, lattice points, not anywhere in between. So, creating and annihilating uh, fermions uh, basically in between has no meaning in this lattice picture. So, the lattice picture forces us to create and annihilate exactly at the lattice points. So, you will see, uh, so you might think that that is a rather radical departure from what you are accustomed to and uh, it becomes hard to swallow that until at least some for somebody like me it is really impossible for me to accept that unless somebody shows me that there is a smooth uh, logical link between my you know p squared by 2 m plus v of r picture which forces I mean which basically tells me the particle can be anywhere it wants and then going from there to this so called tight binding model. So, what I described are just now this, this sort of an assumption of that the electrons can either live on one lattice point or the other and nothing in between that is called the tight binding model okay, because it is tightly bound to one of those lattice sites. So, it is tightly bound to one lattice site or the other. So, it can, so what typically what happens is that conduction takes place when the electron that is tightly bound to one of the lattice sites uh, kind of tunnels across and finds itself on the next one or the neighboring one. So, uh, so that is called hopping. So, these are the kind of, uh, this is a sort of jargon that people use in this field. It is called hopping. Hopping is a kind of uh, what is called kinetic energy for a continuum system is hopping in a lattice system. Okay. So, we will be able to, so the point is that I have to, uh, you know, for the skeptical minded audience who is listening to this uh, lecture, it is really important that I should be able to establish a logical link between the traditional way of thinking about electrons namely that it has a kinetic energy and it has a potential energy due to the surrounding positive charges that are there. So, uh, from there, so we see that way of looking at it, electron can be anywhere. There is no uh, restriction that it cannot be here or there. 
but then from there I have to be able to systematically make a sequence of approximations or assumptions, simplifying assumptions and get to a stage where I can justify the lattice model which, uh, uh, which mandates that uh, every electron is either stuck to one lattice point or the other and it cannot possibly found anywhere else. So, I have to justify that transition. Basically, the remaining part of this lecture and perhaps uh, the next lecture also will be devoted to explaining this connection. Okay, so, I am going to try and derive this. Okay, so, but before that let me tell you what the lattice or the, the hopping term looks like. So, the, so, what we normally associate as kinetic energy of electron, the kinetic motion of electrons due to basically p squared by 2 m type of term. So, if you uh, rewrite that in for the lattice, it would correspond to something like this. So, what this is saying, so let me tell you what these symbols mean. C j sigma, sigma is optional, so, so I have to sum over sigma, I, I omitted that. So, sigma is just a spin projection which is uninteresting, it can, I mean because it is an electron it can have up or down spin. But the important uh, index here is j or i. So, j basically tells you the lattice point in question. So, I have used uh, lower case Latin letters, it does not mean I am looking at one dimension. j can refer to some point in the lattice and the, a lattice can be either one dimensional lattice, two dimensional, three dimensional lattice, it can be any one of those. So, basically j refers to some point on some given lattice. And similarly, I also refers to some other point on the same lattice. So, now I have to sum over i and j, but then there is uh, some funny symbol here that I have put i and j in between, uh, you know, two angular brackets. So, what does that mean? What that means is basically uh, the, um, so the implication is that the kinetic energy of the electrons are due to what is called hopping and hopping is, uh, I am going to show you that the simplest version of the tight binding model which can be derived systematically from the p squared by 2 m plus v of r starting point. So, uh, the simplest version of the tight binding model uh, requires that I should only consider hopping between nearest neighbors. So, that means if j is some point on, on a lattice, on the given assumed lattice, so then this i is uh, supposed to be another point which is not j, but which is closest to j and there can be more than one point that are equally close to j and typically in more than one, well already in one dimension you have two points, one to the left, one to the right, but uh, in higher dimensions you can have more number of points that are closest to j. So, I am supposed to uh, sum over all such pairs of points that are as close to each other as possible without being the same points, ok. So, then I am describing what is called hopping. So, the implication is that an electron can uh, hop only to the nearest neighbor and the chances that it will hop to the next nearest neighbor are overwhelmingly suppressed. That means, the chance, the probability of that happening is very less and to a first approximation may be ignored. So, this is called the nearest neighbor hopping and this can be derived, you know, that this is not like an assumption that you can actually derive this from the traditional p squared by 2 m plus v of r language, ok. So, now you see, uh, now the point is that this only describes, hopping only is like a substitute, is a lattice version of the kinetic energy, right. It is the lattice equivalent of the kinetic energy. So, the kinetic energy is just p square because particle can be anywhere. So, it can have any p, any r, whatever it is, but here the particle can only be on lattice points. So, now uh, what about potential energy? So, what is the lattice equivalent of potential energy? So, of course, if you have some external field that is a separate matter, but I am talking about say the Coulomb interaction between particles, means between electrons, the repulsion. So, if there is one electron, you see 
if another electron tries to sit on the same lattice site, then first of all Pauli principle says that you cannot do that unless one of them is has up spin the other has down spin. So, which is why I have said this. So, this is the uh, number of uh, particles uh, on site i with up spin. This is the number of particles on site i with down spin. So, what this says is that uh, this potential energy is 0 unless there is exactly one fermion with up spin and one fermion with down spin at site i in which case the potential energy is u. So, that is the repulsion term. But then in all other cases 0. So, if there is only one uh, if say up spin is 1, uh, n i up is 1 and n i down is 0 that means there is only one electron and that electron has up spin then it does not have anything to repel it I mean nothing can repel it because I told you, you know far away they do not repel they only repel if there. So, that is that is again the nearest neighbor. So, if there is since they are allowed to sit on top of each other when one is up one is down clearly that is the dominant term right. So, it is only when uh, both are up or both are down right then uh, it is no it is not allowed to sit on top of each other then. So, the, there is something called the extended model which where you have to include that also. Typically, that is important because this see this uh, this model ignores the possibility that if two spins come and both are up, then even though they cannot sit on top of each other, they can at least repel sitting nearby. So, that is not included in this. So, that is the next order term which should uh, logically be included. So, bottom line as you see this approach has this following drawback which you have probably already noticed that it is a whole bunch of ad hoc assumptions that this nearest neighbor hopping, nearest neighbor uh, Coulomb interactions these are all ad hoc assumptions because you uh, see there is no a priori valid reason for ignoring next nearest neighbor, next to next nearest neighbor. So, in fact, uh, lots and lots of papers are published uh, by including one, uh, one after another successively and uh, there is a kind of uh, I mean at least you know, you know the community uh, is inundated with papers of this sort and uh, you know there is an implication that somehow this constitutes progress. But uh, I personally have a different view. So, I feel that this, uh, this way of thinking about solids has actually done a disservice to the subject because it is uh, it is uh, ad hoc in the extreme because there are infinitely many adjustable parameters because the, the you can include the next nearest neighbor which is another see this T and U are already adjustable parameters it is extremely hard to derive them a priori right. Already the existing lattice structure is an as assumed uh, structure from experimental data. On top of that this T and U are also fitted from experiment typically and then uh, the next nearest neighbor terms are also sometimes fitted from experiment. Yeah, you can use uh, something called density functional theory and all that to try and derive these uh, from what are called ab initio methods, but those are uh, very ambiguous and far from being successful. So, bottom line is that uh, this sort of an approach uh, uh, gives you a model with infinitely many adjustable parameters and you know there is this famous uh, mathematician von Neumann who is known to have said also very famously that uh, you give me three parameters I can draw an elephant, you give me one more I can make him wiggle his tail. So, bottom line is that you can describe uh, any organism any system you want if you have sufficient number of parameters in your model. So, that does not mean anything. So, it is just an exercise in curve fitting. So, those are not explanations they are just just wishful thinking. Unfortunately, a lot of condensed matter physics is uh, mostly wishful thinking in disguise. Okay, but then 
given that uh, physics, I mean the literature is filled with such approaches, we are forced to discuss them. But I am making these disclaimers because I feel that it is important for me to express my personal opinion as well. Okay, so question is how do you, uh, that apart, I mean it is true that it has a whole bunch of parameters. But is it true that we can at least derive that whole bunch of parameters from first principles, we can know what they are, right? The next, uh, the hopping coefficient t, the on-site repulsion u, the next, uh, I mean, nearest neighbor repulsion v. So, can all these be derived from some atomistic calculations of the, you know, the atomic structure of the atom that is sitting at the lattice sites? The answer is yes, but it is not easy. So, the question is how do you do that? So, it is a long story and uh, I, I do not know if you have the stomach for it or the patience for it, but uh, those of you who are somewhat uh, unnerved and skeptical about this lattice approach to solids would probably be better off in uh, paying attention to this. But those of you who just want to get on with it, who just want to learn how to use the lattice method to do practical calculations, who could not care less, just want publications, you can just go ahead and skip this section. But then uh, let me just get to this uh, method. So, the idea is that you see, uh, so imagine you have uh, a collection of atoms sitting at some positions called Rn. So, so you have these, uh, so there is a given lattice okay, and this is some typical Rn. N is some discrete index which tells you where that lattice point is. Okay. So, now the thing is that what is sitting here is an actual atom. So, that is why it is called At, At means atom. So, this atom has its own Hamiltonian. So, this atom will have a nucleus which is positively charged. It will have a bunch of electrons that are going round and round that positive charge. So, it will have its own Hamiltonian. So, that Hamiltonian is basically a function of R and a P. Well, it is a function of uh, several R's and several P's, but then I am now going to think of some typical R and typical P. Because remember, in the second quantized notation, I will just have to pre multiply by C dagger R and post multiply by C R and integrate over R and I would have accounted for all the electrons that are there in the atom. So, at this stage I am going to just select some typical electron that happens to be in that particular atom. So, if that is the case then you see um, the Hamiltonian of, uh, so if that, uh, if that atom is sitting at the origin. Yeah, the Hamiltonian of the electron is basically H A T bracket R comma P. So, if that atom is at the origin, but if it is not at the origin, but if it is at some R n. So, if the atom is at the origin, the Hamiltonian is of the electron which is uh, you know tied to this particular atom is H A T uh, within brackets R comma P. But if that atom itself is at some other location called R n instead of being at the origin, then clearly the Hamiltonian for an electron uh, you know going round and round that particular atom is, uh, is this one where R is getting shifted by R n. Okay? So, now if you add up all the um, locations of all the atoms, you will uh, necessarily get the Hamiltonian of all the atoms put together, uh, but then this ignores an important uh, facet and namely that uh, you know the, the total Hamiltonian is not necessarily the sum of the Hamiltonians of all the atoms put together, because that assumes that the atoms do not talk to each other, that is that there is no interaction energy between atoms. See the atoms are electrically neutral because they are the equal number of positive and negative charges that is fine, but then they can still interact with each other. Say for example, if one of them, if they all have dipole moments, then clearly they will interact pretty strongly with the closer neighbors. 
but even if they do not have dipole moments, they can induce dipole moments on one another. So, that is called polarizability or polar. So, they can polarize each other and still interact. So, all those possibilities are there and uh, that is what causes bonding. See, the chemical bond is because uh, if you uh, place atoms on a lattice, if they strictly remain inert, they do not uh, the electrons just uh, interact with the nucleus of the its own atom. It does not even acknowledge the existence of any other atom. Then clearly there is no concept of hopping or there is no concept of chemical bonds or anything of that sort. So, uh, but in nature we do expect all that. So, which is why you need a, we need to postulate that there is a further uh, energy which is over and above whatever you see here. So, this further energy is basically a function of the position of the electron alone and that, that basically tells you. So, the implication here is that the kinetic part is already taken care of by the atomic Hamiltonian. So, the rest of it basically is tells you that the electron is uh, electron of one atom can actually feel the presence of the, the neighboring atoms and that uh, leads to an excess uh, different I mean a correction to the potential energy of the system uh, and that is uh, denoted that by delta of u of r. So, that uh, r is the location of my typical electron in the system and delta of u is basically the extra potential energy which that electron feels due to the fact that the atoms kind of do not influence only their own electrons, but they also influence the electrons of their neighbors. So, that is the reason why you have this extra term. So, now uh, that I have written down the uh, Hamiltonian of a typical electron in such a solid. Now, I can go ahead and write down my second quantized version of all the electrons put together in the solid. So, that is the beauty of the second quantized approach. So, I do not have to do sigma i equal to 1 to some n where n is 10 raised to 36. So, I can just do it for one typical atom and then pre multiply by an, a creation post multiply by annihilation and integrate over all the locations of all the electrons. And then I will end up getting the Hamiltonian of the all the electrons in the solid. Okay. So, now I mean this is still uh, looks very far from my tight binding model. So, this still looks like p squared by 2 m. In fact, that is what this is. This is still I mean there is p squared by 2 m hidden here. So, the question is how would I uh, reach there? So, I am going to now uh, make some assumptions about the nature of the wave functions of this H A T. So, first of all let me uh, postulate that this H A T has some stationary states. right? So, the stationary states of H A T are uh, let us assume that they are labeled by some index called L which could be your orbitals. Okay? So, uh, it will have some, some values. So, um, now, the point is that uh, if I define H total as uh, the sum over all the, uh, so remember I told you that uh, this H A T R comma P, P means uh, this one minus I H bar grad. So, H A T R comma P is the Hamiltonian of an electron tied to this particular atom assuming that particular atom is sitting at the origin. But if it is not sitting at the origin, it is sitting at R n, it is this one. But then uh, you can have R n is uh, like some particular lattice point, but you can have a whole bunch of lattice points and each lattice point has an atom sitting there. So, if you want to take into account the Hamiltonian of all of them, you have to add up all the lattice points. So, which is what I have done here. So, now having done this. You see now the important point is that this Hamiltonian has a has a periodicity. That means, if I take H total and take R and uh, you uh, just uh, translate it by some, uh, some lattice vector, 
this is going to be exactly same as earlier. So, this is going to be periodic in R. So, the Hamiltonian is periodic because I have added up all the atoms locations. So, now if I shift my uh, point of view from one atom to the next, the system still looks the same because I am taken into account all of them and there are infinitely many of them. So, okay. So, it is a kind of a boundary less system, there is no boundary. So, this Hamiltonian is strictly periodic in space. So, if it is periodic in space, uh, we know from solid state physics, which is sort of a prerequisite for this course, but maybe I mentioned this earlier also. So, basically the wave function, the Hamiltonian is periodic does not mean the wave function is also periodic, but it means that the wave function can be related to something periodic. Okay, so, the Hamiltonian is periodic means you can actually rewrite the wave function as something which is very simple like a plane wave multiplied by a periodic function. So, that is what Bloch's theorem says. Bloch's theorem says that if you have a Hamiltonian which is periodic in space, its eigenfunctions or stationary states are not necessarily periodic, but they are writable as a plane wave times a periodic function. So, that is what that is. So, and the Bloch's theorem's proof is given in this square here. So, even if you did not know it earlier, you can just read this square where the proof is there. Okay. Since we know that from Bloch's theorem that there is such a periodic function, now you see I am going to exploit the fact that I can write the periodic function like this, is not it? Because now I have, uh, so it is all related now to the firstly uh, the stationary states of H A T uh, form a complete set. So, I can write any function in as a like a linear combination of those stationary states because they form a basis, right. So, if they form a basis, I can always write like this, but then I am not necessarily going to stop here because I have to make sure that this is periodic. So, I have to shift this and sum over all the Rns, okay. So, when I do that, I get a function which is uh, strictly uh, periodic. Okay. So, uh, that is what that is. So, therefore, the uh, block states that means the wave function of uh, electron in that periodic potential, periodic system can be the plane wave which is this one multiplied by the periodic function. Okay. But uh, because, uh, so now, now is the crucial assumption, this, this is a very crucial step. See, here what I have assumed is that these wave functions psi l, what is this psi l? Remember what this is, this is the stationary state of the atom. So, the implication is that these uh, electrons which are tied to this particular atom are very closely bound, so it is called tight binding. So, that means they are very tightly bound to this particular atom, they do not necessarily venture out too far uh, away from the atom. So, they are tightly bound to that atom. So, if you make that tight binding assumption, so if you make that assumption, then you see uh, what this is saying is that this function itself is very small if r is uh, not close to small, small letter r vector is not close to, is not close to uh, this lattice, one of the lattice because that is where the atoms are located. So, if small letter r is not close to the lattice location this wave function itself is very, very small. So, if that is the case, then there is no loss of generality or uh, uh, I am not making a serious mistake by replacing this R by Rn. Okay. I mean, I know that these are all very crude hand waving. Uh, I am just trying to motivate the transition to tight binding picture. I am not implying that this sort of an analysis is particularly rigorous or anything. I am just saying that this is like a zeroth order calculation which is guaranteed to give you the hopping and on site repulsion and all that, which kind of sort of motivates the uh, this ad hoc uh, approach to solid state physics. I mean it makes you uh, sort of believe it more. But that does not take away from the fact that uh, it really still remains theory with 
a large number of adjustable parameters whose you know ab initio meaning is not at all clear and you have no means of calculating them very easily in a practical system. So, they are also typically fitted from experiment which kind of dilutes the predictive power of those models enormously. All right, so uh, point is that if you accept this, then you go ahead and uh, rewrite so that now you can uh, you see, uh, so any, so now these block states now are the actual, uh, the wave function of the actual uh, electrons in the solid itself, the periodic solid. So, if that is the case, then I can re-express any annihilation operator at some point r in terms of these block states. Now, the coefficients will be the corresponding uh, operators in momentum space, okay. So, I think now I am going to stop because what I am going to do is that in the next class, I will show you how to systematically rewrite. So, remember that uh, the second quantized notation had this. So, I am going to rewrite this, this C's in terms of the block states. So, which will enable me to then uh, you know make a transition to the tight binding model, okay. How I am going to do that I will tell you uh, gradually, okay. So, there is a systematic procedure by which you can do that, okay. So, finally, I will just fast forward and tell you where finally we will end up like this. So, we will actually get that hopping. So, this is the nearest neighbor hopping, okay. So, this is an example for graphene. So, um, bottom line is that it is some effort and we will get there, but then uh, it is a bit of a disappointment and anti climax because having gotten there, all you know is that. Uh, there is a whole bunch of simplifying assumptions you have to make to go from here to there and it is not clear what you have gained by doing this because you have ended up with a model that uh, has a whole bunch of adjustable parameters and it is still as hard to solve as before. The only mild advantage is that it already encodes the structure of the existing lattice. So, that means that you do not have to then derive that also. So, somebody has already told you that this is the lattice and then now you are trying to proceed and see how the electrons behave on that lattice. So, that is the slight advantage, but then the problem remains intractable if you insist on including Coulomb repulsions between electrons on the same lattice sites, okay. And most of the interesting physics happens because of that. I mean when you ignore those uh, terms then you get results which are entirely predictable. But of course, uh, you know in uh, two dimensions uh, like for example, if you have this honeycomb lattice there are some unusual phenomena that take place. They are theoretically very easy to derive, but they are of Im importance because uh, experimentally they have been found to be also realized, meaning they have been realized experimentally and the simplest theoretical description seems to suffice in describing say substances like graphene. So, you do not have to work very hard to describe graphene. So, that is somewhat of a surprise in the sense that uh, if you think about it the tight binding model has so many simplifying assumptions and yet uh, the simplest version of that seems to suffice in describing a whole lot of uh, real systems. So, um, yeah, so that is the reason why many physicists simply do not even bother to inquire about what, why that is. They are quite satisfied, they are quite happy that it works and then they go ahead and publish papers that way. Okay, anyway, so uh, that is a matter of taste. So, I am going to stop here in the next class, I will proceed and tell you how to finally arrive at the hopping term and the on-site repulsion term starting from this continuum picture. I will finish that description and after that we will go on to some other topics. Okay, thanks for listening to me and uh, I intend to uh, upload some video lectures on solving problems from my book, meaning if you, uh, if you have noticed the end of every chapter has 
a large number of problems which I feel you should attempt and, uh, and in order for me to uh, you know facilitate that I am going to solve some of those more difficult ones myself and I am going to upload those videos and I hope uh, after listening to them you will gain more confidence in solving those uh, assignments at the end of each chapter. Okay, thanks for listening to me, uh, see you next time. Mm -hmm.